Um, the other thing I noticed, because and, and one of the things I started immediately going is, okay, where were the autistic? Where were the autistics getting yeah. pigeonholed before? And one of the things I noticed is that that Connor was late, later did some thinking about uh, autism, the kind of aut his his kind of autism, yeah. which is, was very narrowly defined, being somewhere on the schizophrenia spectrum. Yeah, well, definitely one of the here's yeah the one of the re like one of the games that I would play with myself while writing the book was called find the lost autistic people in previous generations. And um, one of the big shockers was that there were hundreds of autistic kids just up the hill from my house in San Francisco at a place called Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. Um, and uh, I found a huge volume of like case histories and reports from Langley Porter. And they were not calling it autism for the most part. They're actually, they're, in a few of the chapters they were, but they were mostly calling it childhood schizophrenia or childhood psychosis. And in an eerie foreshadowing of the so-called autism epidemic uh, of the 1990s, there was an epidemic of childhood schizophrenia in institutions like Langley Porter. Mm -hmm. um, in Bellevue, there were 800 kids diagnosed with childhood schizophrenia by one woman alone. And if you look at the descriptions of childhood schizophrenia, they were autism, autism, autism. These kids were, you know, they had a hard time making friends. They were fascinated by complex machines. They were taking apart the toilets at Langley Porter. Um, <laughs> there were only certain things they would eat. Uh, you know, it was autism. Like the, the, the guy, there was in fact a set of sort of diagnostic criteria called Creek's Nine Points for Mildred Creek in England for diagnosing childhood schizophrenia. It was so good for diagnosing autism that they eventually just sort of changed the application. Um, but so childhood schizophrenia was considered very common in America, actually in lots of places, um, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, now, the occurrence of schizophrenia in childhood is considered extremely rare. Where did those people go? You know, yeah. people say like, people say like, there is an epidemic. It is vaccines. Where were all these autistic kids? You know, well, here they were. Yeah. They were, you know, they were at Langley Porter. They were at Bellevue. You know, and the kids who would get a diagnosis of Asperger or PDD NOS later, they were out of luck. Like they would not get a diagnosis or they would be diagnosed with something weird or, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, the people who say that the proof of the fact that you know vaccines or whatever cause autism is the lack of diagnoses of autism. I spoke to a woman, 88 year old autism specialist who started working with families in the 1940s. So she was like, you know, old school. She told me through the 1980s that by the time a kid got a diagnosis of autism, they had already seen 10 specialists on average before they got to her. How many families of color, how many impoverished families do you think could afford to doctor shop their way through 10 specialists, no matter how committed they were, mm -hmm. you know, before getting a diagnosis of autism? Like, you pretty much had to be tapped. Like, no wonder Leo O'Connor thought that autism was a disorder of the upper middle class. Actually, being a patient of Leo O'Connor was a disorder of the upper middle class. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, interesting. So, and it was interesting to me was that um, the problem with, with, with labeling a child uh, somewhere on the schizophrenia spectrum is that any mental health professional, if your experience of schizophrenia is you basically they, you do a big heavy sigh at that point because there's not much hope. It's, right. It's a very difficult situation. Right. It tends to be progressive. And yeah. here's here's a kid. He's ten years old and he's schizophrenic. Yeah. And and so institutionalizing them and of course. You know, imagine taking a lower medium function autistic and putting them in a state institution and not really giving them any care, but taking care of, you know, letting them, making, keeping them alive. Right. Um, and then come back when they're in their 20s and, and see what you've got. And it's right. not going to be pretty. Well, well even Lee O'Connor recognized that by the 70s mm -hmm. in really one of the most chilling phrases in my whole book, I would say. He said that uh, the kids who went into institutions lost their luster soon after admission. Um, so even the kids who had had sort of savant skills um, would lose them in institutional settings. Mm 
And it's not like there were autism wards in these places. These kids were going to, to psych wards, basically. And um, often with adult psychotics. And so the kids were like, you know, and they weren't kids eventually. I mean, they were growing up in these institutions. And plus, you know, autism sort of became the, the playing field for the latest theory about how to treat autism. So, you know, whether it was electric shock or, you know, the woman at Bellevue who diagnosed those 800 kids, she had a thing where she gave the kids LSD every day for like three months. And if I took LSD every day for three months, I'd be, yeah. you know, terrified. Um, so imagine taking it in a psych ward, basically, if you're a kid, you know. So, and it's amazing, like, basically what people got away with. You know, I mean, that woman who was no, she was no idiot exactly. Like, she was really smart, but she had no one supervising her. She was the head of psychiatry at Bellevue. In fact, she was the head of psychiatry for the state of New York. So it's like there was no one to say, are you out of your mind? You know, like, there was no supervision. No ethics, actually, you know. And um, there's a woman on Twitter named Michelle Dawson who's very tough, and she's... A, not only an autism scientist, but an autistic scientist. And she's really good about the ethics of treatment and intervention and studies. Her, her Twitter tag is Autism Crisis. So, so basically, the case you've been making, and, and, and I feel like it's a pretty strong case, is that really the surge in autism we're seeing is a surge in diagnosis. That right. the diagnosis was changed, and, and that you know, people, now when people come in, to, for instance, in our case, um, our son was three years old and still not talking. And yeah. um, at that point, we started you know, asking our pediatrician, and our pediatrician was coming up with ideas. And, and childhood schizophrenia was on the table. Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. When was this? Whatever? This was uh, 99. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you know, that was still on the list of possibilities. Right, right. And, um, it's, but at that point, the wider diagnosis was there, and that, right. that he ended up with an autism diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Well, the problem is, well, here's the deal with childhood schizophrenia. Um, one of the groups of lost autistics that I found were these teenagers who were treated in Moscow by a Russian psychiatrist named Gruna Sukareva. And she made these very, very beautiful descriptions of what we would now call Asperger's syndrome. Um, and there was no, you know, obviously there was no Asperger's syndrome. Asperger hadn't even done his work yet. Um, but uh, she eventually said, these kids may have something that's related to schizophrenia, but here's the difference. Um, people with schizophrenia usually get worse. Uh, these kids actually get better if you give them the right uh, education and support, and you know, if they're interested in music, help them play music. If they're interested in art, help them do art. And they, you know, they become incredibly expressive. And the other thing that she captured, which I love, is that the kids were very subversive and very funny. Like often, uh, like one of the del one of the del delights or comic reliefs of doing the research in my book is when sometimes I would pick up jokes that the kids were making in these case histories that the doctors weren't getting because the doctors thought the kids were like mentally ill. You know, and so in, in one of the case histories, it's not from Moscow then, but it was from uh, the 50s, actually, I think. There's this kid who is really into the planets uh, and the solar system. And he would, he would give lectures in the shower at camp, uh, where, you know, and that was considered a terrible discipline problem, that he would <laughs> lecture the kids on science, you know. And at one point, he asked the doctor who's writing the case history, to name the nine planets. And, uh, you know, the doctor's like, you can see the obsession. Uh, and, you know, and the doctor can't name the nine planets. And, and the kid says, well, actually, one of them was named after the, the Greek god of the sea. You know, and the, the doctor, like, doesn't get it, you know. And, uh, and it actually turns out to be Roman god of the sea. As an autistic person pointed out earlier today on Facebook. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so... Um, she figured out that these kids had something. She related it that maybe it's schizophrenia, maybe not. And then what Leo Connor did was he defined autism so narrowly that it still left a lot of people like that didn't weren't included. 
And he sort of farmed out the rest of the spectrum to childhood schizophrenia. Because when his paper came out, in which he said, the, a heretofore unreported condition. And one of the other scoops that I found in my book is that in his very first paper that ever got published, he, he wrote about um, basically a, a, a Native American tribal elder with syphilis. And he made it seem as if that was incredibly rare. And he's, you know, in this heretofore unreported, like basically that was a riff. And he figured out that if he pr portrayed a case as very, very rare, that his colleagues would pay more attention to it. And nobody had ever busted him for this before, but I noticed. Like, the one thing about Lee O'Connor is that he, and by the way, I, I know it sounds like I'm painting him in altogether terrible terms, but he did count on the fact that no one would ever have something called Google that would allow you to find all of his papers all at once and read them all, you know? And so, that, so like later, he said, I never blamed parents, you know? Really? Like, I have like 20 papers, you know? Um, so...